Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. Should the world start preparing for a future where life-saving drug innovation no longer originates primarily in the West? Well, that really is the huge strategic question right now, isn't it? We're seeing what you could call the great biotech reshuffle, mm -hmm. the uh, foundations of the global life sciences industry. Yeah. They're shifting. Yeah. And definitely shifting eastward. Exactly. And there's this fascinating tension we're tracking. You have this feel, this narrative of fatigue in the American life sciences sector, which has been the powerhouse for so long. Mm -hmm. And right alongside that, you see this, well, undeniable surge in China's biotech industry. Hmm. And it's not just about making things cheaper anymore. This feels like a real shift in, you know, where the actual innovation is happening. And the signs of that American fatigue they're pretty clear in the data. I mean, look at market performance. Yeah. Over the past year, the S&P 500 index overall. Yeah. Up a huge 19%. Right. But the S&P 500 healthcare sector actually fell 1%. Right. Okay. Help me understand that. A 20-point gap between the overall market and healthcare. That's massive for a sector we usually think of as stable, almost defensive. Is that dip just about past performance, or is the market already worried about the future? It seems to be a mix, but yeah, heavily weighted towards future risk. You dig a bit deeper, and specific big names are, well, struggling. Pfizer's reporting sales and profit drops. Gilead Sciences facing weaker sales. Illumina, the genomics leader, even projected a revenue decline. So systemic pressure. Exactly. It signals something broader. And look at short-selling activity. Healthcare is attracting the most shorts on the S&P right now. Moderna was apparently the most shorted stock on the index back at the end of September, that level of short interest. It screams skepticism about future growth. So if we look at the immediate causes people are pointing to for this slowdown, it, it sounds like more than just a typical downturn. What are the big structural issues the U.S. industry is hitting? Yeah, there are really three main things coming together. First, you've got rising tariffs, geopolitical friction, mm. just making global supply chains more complicated. Mm. Second, there's definitely mounting political pressure here in the U.S. to lower drug prices, mm. especially for those really expensive breakthrough therapies. But maybe the biggest immediate financial hit, it's the patent cliff. Ah, uh, yes. The patent cliff. Huge. Estimates suggest over $300 billion in global sales are at risk just from key patents expiring between now and 2030. 300 billion. That's a massive hole to fill with new innovation. And the money needed for that innovation, the venture capital, it sounds like it's looking elsewhere. That's a big part of it. VC, which fuels that early risky discovery, yep. it seems to have shifted focus pretty heavily toward AI, other big tech areas. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, that might come at the expense of funding traditional high risk, long timeline biotech projects. All right. And this feeds right into the pressure on that traditional U.S. winning formula. The environment that created those incredibly profitable blockbuster drug companies. Mm. It's changing, maybe even disappearing. Hang on, though. If $300 billion is potentially walking out the door from expiring patents and short sellers are circling, that sounds a lot like decline, maybe even collapse. What are we missing? You're suggesting it's more adaptation than retreat. We absolutely need that nuance here. Yes, the old model is under incredible pressure, no doubt. Mm. But the entire sector isn't just folding. What we're seeing is more like an expensive, difficult repositioning. America is adapting by really doubling down on new types of therapies, areas where the sheer scientific complexity still offers a competitive edge. Adaptation how, specifically? What does that actually look like? It means U.S. firms are pouring money into things that honestly sounded like science fiction just 10 years ago. We're talking next-gen stuff like in vivo gene therapy, where the correction happens inside the body. Or ex vivo gene therapy, advanced cell therapies like personalized cancer treatments, and maybe most critically, integrating AI into the drug discovery process itself. So while old revenue streams are threatened by generics, uh, uh, fundamental science for these cutting-edge approaches yeah. is still arguably strongest in U.S. labs and universities. So it's a shift, a complex one. It's an adaptation to a more globalized competitive world, not a surrender. Yeah. But it's slower, it's riskier, and frankly, that makes investors nervous. Okay, so if VC is getting a bit cautious on traditional U.S. biotech and maybe top global talent is looking for places with, say, more open research environments or easier immigration, where is that momentum and that talent actually going? Seems like eastward. It really does. And yeah. when you look at China, the story is just one of incredible measurable momentum. And like you said, we're way past just talking about low cost generic manufacturing mm -hmm. now. This is high tech innovation being driven from within China. Let's get concrete then. How big is the surge we're seeing? OK, look at the market value. 
There are roughly 550 listed Chinese life sciences firms. Their combined market value, about $1.2 trillion. $1.2 trillion. And here's the kicker. That collective value is up 46% just since the start of this year. Compare that to their U.S. peers, which saw about a 9% rise. That difference, it signals massive investor confidence in China's future growth. And the projections back that up, right? The market size itself. Automatically. The Chinese biotech market was maybe $74 billion in 2023. It's projected to potentially hit $263 billion by 2030. That implies a compound annual growth rate around, what, nearly 20%. Wow. Wow. They are absolutely playing a different game right now. And the perception has shifted, too. It's not just copycat anymore. Not at all. They're becoming leaders in really technical fields. Think robotic surgery companies like Microport, advanced medical imaging firms like United Imaging. And this isn't just hype. It's showing up in the financials. Jeffries estimated the median return on capital for Chinese developers in 2024 could be around 7% for their U.S. counterparts, basically 0%. That is a stark difference in profitability. But, you know, the real test of global competitiveness isn't just having a huge home market. It's exporting your innovation, right? Selling it globally. That's the true measure. Absolutely. And this this is probably the single most significant metric showing the power shift underway. Rawr. Look at global drug licensing deals, the value of those deals. Right. In just the first quarter of 2025, Chinese developers accounted for an incredible 32% of that global value. 32% from China. 32%. A decade ago, that number was less than 3%. What this tells you is that Western Big Pharma is increasingly looking to China to refill its own R&D pipelines. Why? Because Chinese labs are producing high-quality, innovative, early-stage drug candidates that are competitive on a global scale. So the takeaway is China's becoming a critical source for Western R&D. We're sort of becoming dependent on their science. In many ways, yes. We're seeing huge high-value partnerships forming incredibly quickly. Novartis, for instance, agreed to potentially pay Argo Biopharma up to $5.2 billion for cardiovascular drugs developed in China. Pfizer has a major collaboration with 3S Bio. And PwC Research backs this up. They found that about a third of the new molecules being licensed into U.S. pharma companies now actually originate from China. That was basically zero just five years ago. Uh Third. Wow. That's rapid integration. It's a fundamental integration of Chinese science into the Western drug development system, happening very fast. And underpinning all this must be a strong basic research base. I saw a figure suggesting China's output in areas like synthetic biology is massive. Yeah, findings like those from Maris Doherty have pointed China, accounting for something like 61% of global synthetic biology papers by 2022. That research engine is, well, it's running hot. And it's directly feeding this boom in licensing deals. It shows the depth of talent they've built up and the strategic public investment. Okay, speaking of structure, the material we looked at mentioned that China's life sciences system actually uses a model that looks pretty familiar, kind of like the U.S. approach. That's right. They seem to have studied the U.S. playbook, particularly from the 2000s, and implemented it very effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, public funding backs academic research. Right. Researchers are encouraged to commercialize discoveries through startups, venture capital comes in with targeted funding, and then the big established companies scale up the winners. That basic structure is definitely there. But the comparison only goes so far. China's version seems to have some unique elements that really accelerate growth, maybe in ways the U.S. system doesn't or can't right now. That's the crucial point. While the pieces look familiar, China has layered on some distinct advantages. There's much stronger state direction, clear industrial policy through national biotech plans. They've also pushed through significant regulatory reforms, speeding up drug reviews via their FDA equivalent, the NMPA. Which means getting new drugs to market faster with little China. Much faster. But probably the most distinctive edge, and this is something the U.S. just structurally cannot easily replicate, is China's huge, centrally coordinated public hospital system. Ah, oh, for clinical trials. Exactly. This system makes it dramatically easier and faster to enroll large numbers of patients into clinical trials. Turning them into a clinical trial powerhouse. Essentially, yes. They can get patient groups together much quicker than the more decentralized, sometimes slower systems common in the West. This gives them a real speed advantage in development, accelerating their whole innovation cycle. So they took the U.S. model and added state-backed efficiency and, crucially, clinical trial velocity. Okay, but even with all that momentum, those state advantages, there are growing geopolitical headwinds, right? Creates a tricky situation for Western companies and governments. 
This is the big limiter. It's what stops this shift from being, you know, absolute or complete. The U.S., in particular, is pushing back on the strategic risks of becoming too reliant on a geopolitical competitor for critical technologies, including biotech. You see things like the Biosecure Act being discussed in Congress. Right. That aims to restrict federal funding for work with certain Chinese biotech firms. Precisely. It could directly hit major Chinese players in genomics and contract research. It highlights this fundamental tension policymakers are wrestling with. How do you balance national security concerns and strategic competition against the practical need, maybe even the ethical need, to access innovative, potentially life-saving medicines wherever they come from? Yeah, if the best new heart drug comes from a Chinese lab, do you block access for your own citizens? It's yeah, tough. It is. And while there's talk of onshoring or friendshoring, the reality is that this kind of innovation is now deeply globalized. Trying to completely decouple is incredibly disruptive, very expensive, and could genuinely harm patient health globally. So we're forced into managing this complex cross-border risk in a vital sector. And we also need to keep the commercial side in perspective. Even with all the impressive research and licensing deals, China still faces some gaps, right? Absolutely. That's the final piece of important nuance. Despite the licensing boom and leading research output in some fields, China's actual share of the global commercial biotech market revenue is still relatively small compared to the U.S. and Europe. One estimate put it at only around 4.8% of global revenue for 2024. So the high quality early science is there, increasingly so, but it's not yet translating into the same kind of global blockbuster drugs or the same level of global market reach as established Western companies have. Not yet. That's the next big hurdle for him. Converting that research productivity into globally recognized multi-billion dollar medicines and building that decades long experience in global commercialization the sales, the marketing, navigating regulations in dozens of countries outside Asia. That takes time. Okay. So the accurate way to frame this isn't that China has already replaced the U.S. as the world's life science innovator. It's more that China is now fundamentally and rapidly challenging U.S. dominance across the entire innovation spectrum, from discovery right through to development. Which means for U.S. companies, for investors, right. they have to seriously rethink things. They need strategies to integrate potentially crucial assets originating from China while also managing all that geopolitical risk and regulatory scrutiny. That sounds like a very difficult balancing act. It's a real tightrope walk. And part of that involves watching talent flows very carefully. If the best global scientific minds continue to see more opportunity, better funding, or faster paths to clinical trials in the East, well, that could lead to a more permanent slowing of the U.S. innovation engine. The game really has changed. So as innovation truly goes global, and we see this momentum shift potentially towards strategic rivals, what does, depending on such a globalized value chain, really mean for national health security, for resilience in the decades to come? That is a profound question and one that policymakers are going to be grappling with for a long time. Thanks for listening. Follow us for daily insights into world affairs. And don't forget to like, comment, and share.